a shared screen. Thumbs up, all right. Is it changing slides? Sometimes it doesn't. All right, so five years ago, I was sitting on the beach in Turks and Caicos, uh, drinking a beer, and I had a lot of free time on my hands, and I said, whoa, I read all this cool stuff. Let me just send this newsletter to this, not newsletter, let me send these five links to 36 people. And so uh, I sent out this, oops, that's strange. I, oh. So I sent out this email to, uh, to a handful of people. Uh, there were a few articles, a few links to videos and uh, wrote a sentence to describe it. You can see the date, Jan January 10th, 2015. My daughter was like uh, eight months old. And uh, I signed it off with a prophetic, um, well, my keyboard is not working well. Sorry about that. Ugh. iTunes. There we go. I signed it off with a prophetic. I'm not sure when I'll find the time to do the next one. Um, so that was in January of 2015. Since then, we went from 36 subscribers to 18,000, uh, spanning 252 issues, two kids, and a move to LA and a, an, and a job change. So I want to walk you guys through that and, and how that happened. And what I want to say is that the, that the numbers themselves don't even tell the full story about the transformation that took place thanks to this newsletter. Um, CNN and Bloomberg wrote articles about me directly attributable to the newsletter. Um, I was named the first entrepreneur in residence at Quartz, a media company with zero writing experience other than my newsletter. I got off, asked to do a TED talk. I was uh, approached to be a coach uh, for hedge fund managers. That's Wendy Rhodes from Billions. Um, and somehow along the way, I started teaching a pretty profitable course on Notion. And so I'm here to tell you that the newsletter was just the gateway into um, so many other incredible things that have completely, completely transformed my life. And I wanna share those tools with you. The crazy thing is that I'm not a writer. I'm a computer science major. Um, I'm a programmer. I actually didn't take any English classes in undergrad. Um, I, for the first 10 years of my adult life, from 20 to 30, I was so focused on my career that I didn't even read any fiction. I only read textbooks. And so how did I go on to, I've probably written five to seven million words in the past five years. How did that happen and how was I able to get this newsletter going? So I wanna start off with two rappers, Childish Gambino and Post Malone. Um, you may not know this little fact about them, but their names, the na the, their names, their rap names were, uh, purely created by a rap name generator. So you go into this website, you type in some words that describe your interest, and it spits out a name. And that spit out Childish Gambino, and that spit out Post Malone. Think about it, right? These are like Grammy-winning, prolific authors, and they're just like, fuck it. I'm just going to start. I'm going to come up with some name off of an internet website, and I'm just going to start. And, and Post Malone in particular, like, just like cut his teeth in SoundCloud rap, just cranking out these lo-fi videos and songs until he kind of transcended up into the next level. And so the key, one of the keys that I hope we take away from this is to just start. Um, my rap name through a generator, if you, in case you're wondering, is Big Corky. Um, so how do you just start? What I would say to you is go to the iPhone of newsletters and that's Substack. It's free, it's clean, it's uh, beautifully designed. Uh, it basically, it's the medium.com of email newsletters. Uh, you can sit, get set up and you could get set up and start and send your first email within five minutes. Um, there are a few downsides to su using Substack and I cover it on this slide where if you have plans to expand and eventually own your own brand, Substack will be limiting. Uh, mean, and the, the biggest way that Substack is limited is that you do not get to attach your domain to Substack. So if I were to create rad reads on Substack, it would be like K at, um, rad, I think it's radreads.substack.com, or it might just even be K at substack.com. 
Uh, if you go to the website, you're just going to k.substack.com and you basically see the archive and you get a landing page where people can sign up. It's beautiful, uh, it's clean, it's mobile friendly. Um, but uh, as you, if you have plans to grow, it, be, it can become limiting. Uh, another, another disadvantage of using Substack, and this is a little bit more subtle, but uh, SEO. And by SEO, I mean you earn, if you write about a topic that would get picked up by search engines, um, if, if you, let's say you write about like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for kids. I'm picking like a niche, a niche topic. Uh, if people search Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for kids, it will, that search will go to Substack. And if you decide one day to move to, you know, Colin.com or Evan or Radhika.com, you will lose that traffic. It will still go to Substack. You don't own that. And as you build out a brand, uh, SEO becomes very, uh, can be a, an important part of your growth strategy. The other thing is you might not want, I would argue against having an, uh, um, a newsletter just in isolation. Like you'd probably want to have an about me page or some basic, simple, standalone, one-off page that can just tell people who you are. For example, like people will search your names in Google. People will, if, you, if your newsletter has a different name, people will search it in Google. It might not be a lot, but you want people to actually be able to go something that's quote unquote on brand. And that could mean using your logo. That could mean using your colors. Again, we might, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I want you to balance between the trade-off between just starting right away and, and building something, investing a little bit more time up front so that you could reap the benefits should you grow. Um, and if you do, so if you do want to take that extra step beyond Substack, what I would say is um, buy a domain. And I've in, included three places you could buy domains. I use Namecheap and Google domains. I've heard really good things about uh, Pork Bun and the logo is so cute and uh, um, and uh, the name is funny that uh, I, I'm going to give it a try next time I need to buy a domain. Uh, then you need to create, then you need to select an email provider that we'll plug into. So like Substack can't plug into a domain. So I've used MailChimp for a very long time. Um, MailChimp's very, very solid. I currently use ConvertKit, which is much, much more advanced, but it's fantastic. Uh, and I could do a whole session just on how fantastic ConvertKit is. And I've been playing around a lot uh, in my effort to teach, you know, new, aspiring newsletter uh, creators uh, with MailerLite, which is kind of like a low frills um, uh, mailing service, but that still has the connectivity into other tools. So, for ex so, um, so I'll talk about what that means. So that, that would be, and there's like hundreds of email service uh, providers. I think the most important thing that you would look for is the ability for that um, service to plug into other parts of the ecosystem that you're trying to uh, build, which presumably in the early phase would be wherever you host your website. So can your website talk to your email provider in a way that, that doesn't require like lots of extra layers of integration. Um, when it comes to making a, a, a web page, I absolutely love the website builder card called card.co. It has two R's and basically you can make single page websites like, um, but they can have sections so they can feel like multiple page websites. They are so beautiful. They have all these templates. It's like 19, dollars a year so it's ridiculously cheap and they have a free tier as well and it integrates into mailer light convert kit mailchimp uh stripe gumroad anything e-commerce payments um and so um so card makes for you could you could quickly set up you know colinsteel.com uh that's probably taken but colinsteel.xyz um you could buy that on google domains set that up to point to card.co get a, a template that has just a sign up bar like a form hook it up into mailer light and you'd be off to the races all of that would take under four hours uh and it would cost like uh, under 20 bucks a month um so that would be again that's if you have plans to expand into other things. But also keep in mind, the cool thing about a newsletter is that unlike a following on Facebook or a following on Instagram, 
the the ultimate quote i hate to refer to you guys as assets the ultimate uh thing that you own is an email address and the the fact that that person opted in so you can actually you could still start on substack and then move over to these services once you've gotten a little bit of traction so I, what i want you to take away from this especially if you're new to this is just like just the fastest thing to get you to start if this page is seems too daunting and will prevent you from starting just go with substack and deal with this when when your time has come and honestly a lot of maybe not this group in particular but a lot of people won't even make it to that next phase where they're like i like doing this thing i'm good at it and i want to grow it longer so that's the tech stack and i'll take questions at the end we're about 50 percent through the presentation um the next question people come to me is like well i don't have any ideas i'm not interesting i'm not i don't have anything to write about and and i would say like do you have a job do you read the news uh do you have hobbies do you surf do you mindlessly surf the internet do you read um keep in mind that uh your rabbit holes are other people's treasures uh and so if you like i love note-taking software like there's a gigantic community probably like 20,000 people in the world that are obsessed with note taking. That's a huge market, uh, especially like I'm not even trying to sell anything. I just like reading about note taking apps. And then I could, you know, I could write a little thing about a note taking app or I could search for articles about note taking apps or, you know, kids jujitsu like that. that there, there's a gigantic, just where I live, there's a huge audience for uh, jujitsu for kids. And so just remember that even if you think it's like wasting your time, like reading the backstories of Game of Thrones or some obscure Reddit thread that like no one seems to care about, just the fact that there's a Reddit thread signifies that people are actually interested in that topic. Um, another approach, if you don't have any ideas, is people like to follow other people's learning journeys. So you can just take people on your learning journey. And this is how meta it is, where you could take people on your learning journey of starting an email newsletter. If you think about Rad Reads, like everything I've done, I've documented it. And like me learning about Notion led to me sharing about Notion, led to people be saying like, I'm interested in Notion, led to people saying, I'll pay you for a class on Notion, right? Uh, the same thing, like I'll, I'll be totally upfront with you guys. Like I did not expect the response to that post on newsletters. It instantly planted a seed. Like I could potentially teach a class on that. But again, I'd have to go through all these steps first, right? Converting 2,000 people, four, 2, 000, four people from a 2,000 person list shows the, the odds that you're up against when you're asking people to pay for something. Um, and so, but just remember that anything that you're trying to learn about, like it could be so niche as like the, I've seen newsletters about uh, how parents research which like schools to put their kids in, like the process of researching private schools in their local city. That's, that would be an extremely popular newsletter. And again, I think you want to stick with things that, in, that, that like truly interest you. But if that, that, that topic truly interests people, um, it, it's, it's important. So um, it, it could be a starting place. So, I think in this phase of like, well, what am I going to write about? There's, there's always like a tension where like you don't really know, right? Like, and so you could start really broad or you're like, you could start really narrow. You, you know, you're like, I work in uh, diversity in the tech industry. So I want to write a newsletter about diversity in the tech industry. I think from a marketing proposition, and I don't want you, if you're starting off to think too much about marketing, Narrow is easier to get people to sign up because it's a specific thing. And if you just find where those people hang out, you have a natural audience. Um, like, for example, if I said I'm going to do a class on a uh, newsletter on kids Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, if I went to all my friends who didn't have kids, they wouldn't be interested in it. But I could quickly figure out where the other parents are and they would be interested. You could flip it upside down and just say, have like more of a kitchen sink broad newsletter where there it's people that are more interested in you 
Evan, you, Colin, you, Radhika, uh, Radhika, and they're just curious about what you're working on, I think that's easier than nailing down your own idea up front, unless you have something that's like burning a hole, an idea that's burning a hole in your pocket. And if you look at Rad Reads over the years, I don't know how long you guys have been subscribed, but the first year was like very heavy on like FinTech and AI because I thought I was going to do something there. Then like I quit my job and then I went into like an existential rabbit hole and it was like a lot about mortality and fear and insecurities and anxiety. And then I thought I was thinking about starting a social venture fund. And so it was a lot of like about articles about like social justice and equality, gender equality and um, leveling the playing field. And then I began my coaching practice and it became, it morphed into like, what's the psychology of money? Uh, and then I kind of notion came out and it had like a productivity angle. So it, and like people who have followed this long enough, like they're totally okay with that because they're here for the journey. Um, they're not here for like a singular thing. It does get harder. Like for example, now I'm trying to, to pitch a, a book deal and like book publishers are not interested in the kitchen sink approach. Like they want like, what's your narrowly defined idea that reaches the most people. And by being more of a generalist, I haven't really come up with that. So that's like hurting me in the process of getting a book deal. But at the, at the flip side, if I had had to define things so narrowly three years ago, five years ago, I just, I would have flamed out. Like I, I needed it to be an expansive canvas that let me, that was like a vehicle for self-discovery. So a few more slides. So pick a template. I got it and I'll share all these slides. You could do the typical link curation, right? This is Tim Ferriss's five, five bullet Fridays, what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, what I'm reading. Um, you could do my approach, five art, five links. Um, that there's, uh, James Clear has a three, two, one. I think it's three, three articles, two quotes, one something. Uh, something like that. Consistency does, consistent format does help because the same way McDonald's, Starbucks, and uh, Dunkin' Donuts taste the same everywhere, you're, you do want to train your reader to, people like consistency. They like to know what they're getting each day. Uh, it reduces like a level of mental friction. Another template is the link blob. Um, I made up that term. Uh, I don't love reading the link blob. I, I find it a little bit hard to read, uh, but it's quick. It's effective. It, it works. This is from Ann Friedman's newsletter. It's fantastic. I read it all the time, even though I don't like the link blob format. I still click on, you know, one to two stories from out of every blob. Um, I bet this takes her like 20 minutes, excluding the reading time. I think it probably post takes her like 20 minutes to put together. Uh, then the, you can curate like weird things. So on the left, there's a newsletter called Co-Founder Weekly, where they just curate funny tweets from the week. I freaking love this newsletter. It's so good. Uh, and like, presumably the founders love wasting time on Twitter. So it's actually not that hard for them to find clever tweets. And they organize them in like different little sections, like the funnies, the first things for startup investors, um, something like that. The newsletter on the right is called Unread It, and it's a series of newsletters where they curate um, interesting subreddit threads. I know I'm so bad at Reddit. Threads within subreddits. Um, and so I hate going to Reddit, but I'm actually really interested in what people in slash r slash productivity are talking about. So I just subscribe to their newsletter, and every week they send me the top five threads from slash r slash productivity. And they have like 20 of them, like design, architecture, startups, like things like that. Simple. Um, the other, if you're going more broad, this is uh, Dave Perel's um, fantastic newsletter, Monday Musings, uh, which is like the update. And it's just like, this is what I did this week. And you know, you could talk about a conversation you had, a thought that you had, um, a thing that you read. It gives you like the canvas to kind of share what you're thinking. It definitely requires a little bit more writing, um, but it, it has, it, it gives you a little bit of freedom before you, it gives you a little bit of freedom that you don't have to stick to the same format. He actually does have like multiple subsections. His newsletter is like longer than Rad Reads. It's, it's really, really good. Uh, but the update is, is a good one, especially if people are in, in like flux. Like I think 
rad reads was almost like a giant update because it's like i left the corporate world and and i'm just updating you for five straight years on like what the heck's happening uh during that time period so the update is another template um so next my challenge to you is i mean so many people come to me saying they want to start a newsletter and i say fine i give them the talk that i just give them and i'm just like can you make it to week 25 um, 25, by the way, is, is half a year if you're writing weekly, which is, it's a lot. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of commitment. Uh, and I would say, you know, in the early days, Rad Reads would probably take me eight hours. And now it probably, eight hours just to do like five link blogs. Uh, and now it probably takes me eight hours, but it's like 10, it's like an essay, link blogs, like some other commentary and so on. So you'll, you'll get better at it. Um, but just showing up. It's like anything. It's like exercise. It's like investing. It's like sleep. It's like being a good person in networking. Uh, if you just show up consistently with the right intention, shit's going to happen for you. Uh, but the challenge is that no one, I mean, I can count on like two hands how many people have made it past week 25. Um, and it, it just shows. And, and to me, what that says is, is two things. One, it probably wasn't the right thing for you, or you might have been doing it for the wrong reason, um, or uh, you don't you don't know what you want, right? Or you have trouble committing to things. Uh, and, and so I would give this challenge to you, where I would say, you know, there's this framework that I've written about where people try to be consistently heroic, where they try to. Uh, hit a home run every single at bat. No, I would focus on just getting on base, like the money ball strategy, just do that small thing. And if you look at all my newsletters, there's going to be a lot of mediocre ones, but it was the consistency that people cared about. The standard was, you have to clear a, a, a threshold of quality, but the, the threshold of quality to stick with the baseball analogy is getting on base. It's not hitting a home run. And if you can clear that threshold, you're clean, you're, there's no typos, it's easy to read, it's you know, somewhat interesting, then you're, to you're totally, totally uh, uh, going to make up with it in consistency. And you, you'll have a competitive advantage because 99% of your competition will have stopped by that point. Um, so the next question though is, I have no audience. Um, and as you saw, for me, it was a Gmail with 36 people in the BCC. I'm pretty sure that you all, between your friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, random people you meet, could uh, make it to 40 people. Um, and so invite all your friends and family. Please, please, please do not automatically sign them in. A newsletter is personal. Um, it's in people's private space respect that ask them to opt in even if they're like i don't even if you don't know what they're writing about you're writing about even if they're not sure what they're even if they're doing a favor by receiving it it doesn't matter you just just having that that, that accountability that there's even someone told me is like you know there's like my mom my my this my that it was like 10 friends and family and it was two people who he had no idea how they found out how they found the newsletter he didn't know them and he was just like the stakes of writing for those two people just totally changed the game for him. Um, and he was just like, oh, like strangers care about this. They're two, but they care. And so it, 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 it brought, it raised his level of commitment. It raised his level of accountability. Um, other little tricks that work, put landing pages, uh, which is a sign-up page everywhere in your Facebook profile, in your LinkedIn profile, in your Twitter bio, on your Tumblr page, on your YouTube page. Like, believe it or not, people click on these. Um, and so, uh, again, that might get you one to two in the early days, but that's all that matters. You Just having one or two strangers will be enough to get you going. Um, add it to your email signature. Right? I mean, we probably all send between 20 and 100 emails a day. Obviously, not your work email. That, people might get annoyed. Uh, but add it to your signature. People are just going to be intrigued. Like, what? Huh? I didn't know. What's this? You know, the, they, they might come for the voyeurism and they might stick around for the product. Uh, so change your email signature and then just talk about your newsletter. Uh, again, the early days, right? You go from two to four. 
you're doubling, you've increased your, your audience by 100%. I mean, for me to increase my 100, audience by 100% means 18,000 new subscribers. So you got to start somewhere. Take advantage of the, uh, of the laws of compounding in the early days because you're going to lose them in the later days. Uh, and then be clever about it, right? You could copy and paste your newsletter into Medium. You could create an Instagram story about it. And then I, I use the questions, like ask a question. It's like, do you want, Evan's probably signed up on something through this. Like, would you like me to send you this blog post? And it's like, put in your email address into the question sticker. And you can't even copy and paste. But again, like anything entrepreneurial in the early days, you got to hustle. Like I'm retyping Evan Cherry's address, even though I have all versions of it across my, uh, you know, across my different email servers. So, and then another little thing you could do is tag, if you feature other writers, tag them in your newsletter, uh, tag them in social when you share your post. Um, they rarely retweet it, retweet it, but occasionally they will. Um, it will help, you know, someone will, someone will, people will retweet it, someone will find it. Again, it just it increases uh, the visibility that will get you to what I think is a good solid 40, which is a, is a legit audience to write for. If you think about it, you're, you are going, if you make it to 25, you're going to have a thousand touch points um over a six month period with people like that it doesn't matter what you do or what your goals are that's a lot um and so with that i think the before last question you're all going to be thinking about is like well how do i monetize this it's hard it took me five years just to get into the game of monetization i am still living out of my savings. I have a part-time job. I have a billion hacks consulting. Like it is extremely difficult. I don't think you can think about this as a business for a very, very long time. I think you have to treat it as a creative project that opens doors. It's opened all of the business doors that I've been able to walk to. It hasn't created the businesses themselves. Um, I think you also need to, to, you know, once you get beyond week 25, I think you need to prove that you can create value to people. And I think that's where you start to narrow your focus a bit. You start to be known for something a little bit more specific. Uh, your voice starts to crystallize. Um, but I, I think that thinking about monetization, uh, I, I'll just tell you, and this is not just me talking, newsletter, like it is very, very, very hard to monetize a newsletter. Just for context, the CPM, is like uh, the CPM of a newsletter is like 35 bucks or, or 25 bucks, something like that. Um, and so that means for every thousand subscribers, you'd get $25. But that doesn't take into account that you have to find the people. Like it's not just, you can't like plug into a service. Like you have to find the person, then you have to create the ad with them. Then you have to do the ops on it. You have to report back on it. it I give up. It wasn't even worth it um, uh, for me. You actually need us. I think you need a sales force to do it. You can monetize through Substack. It allows you to do, create a private a second newsletter where people will pay you. I think that's really challenging. Um, even me, like I, I just, I think I'm a talented news writer person. I don't think people would pay me for my newsletter specifically. They might pay me for other things, but if I was like, I'll send you a rad reads bonus on Thursday. I don't think people would pay for that. I wouldn't pay for that. I get too much email already. Um, so, so I think monetization is tough, but and now I'm just speaking from experience, um, having built an audience. I have a canvas now to experiment with things, right? And experiment makes it like, I don't mean that in a patronizing way, like I can fuck around on your, your time. It means no, like I can try out different ideas like this and see if people respond to it with the leading purpose always being, I'm starting with, with adding value and are people going to reciprocate? Do people agree that I'm adding value? A, they agree by showing up. B, they agree by a much, much higher threshold by like opening up their wallets, which is a much, much higher threshold. As we could see from the, you know, 2000 signups to the five people on the line today. Um, but again, in the long game, it compounds. And like I said, anything, I don't think, I mean, with the exception of, of exercise, there are probably very few things that people can do every week for five straight years. And, and I'm not saying that like to, to, 
for, to make myself feel special, I just, I look around and there's just not that many newsletters that have been around for 200 weeks, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're getting into the point of the Ferrises and the so on when you're starting to get into the years uh, in, in play, Shane Parrish, uh, and I'm far from, far from, from like not, nowhere in their leagues, uh, but, but the, the field really does start to dwindle once you get out of the 25, and then once you get into the year zone, there's just, there's just very few people. Uh, but if you do, then the doors are constantly, constantly opening. I, I am constantly getting pitched random business opportunities because people know what I'm thinking about. And they know my thinking. They know how I think. And therefore, they come in as inbound, as potential collaborators. Um, so again, to be very crude, I've done five years of content marketing on myself. Uh, to be more uh, nuanced, uh, I've, I've given myself five years worth of opportunities to share you know, how my thinking has evolved with a large number of people and things are arising because of that. So I'll leave you with last, one last word of wisdom. This is from Matt Clifford. He's the founder of Entrepreneur First, which is like the Y Combinator of Europe. Uh, he says like the, he really thinks about his newsletter uh, internal, right? They're internal benefits to you. It's long-term. If you, if you write about stuff you care about long enough, people will come. But regardless, you're gonna massively profit, benefit from the process and discipline of writing it, writing. So with that, I thank you. Um, I would presume you're all signed up to the newsletter. I would just briefly plug that I'm launching my next Notion course on January 21st. So sign up at notion.courses. And I will now um, flip, stop sharing my screen and open it up to any questions. Chat's open, but you know, we're a small group. I'd love for you to pop in on the video. Okay, why did you write the second one? I'm sorry? Why did you write the second one? The second newsletter? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Uh, I had a lot of fun writing the first one. Um, I got really good feedback from people. They're like, this is cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I realized, maybe not the second one, but I realized right away that things that I assumed were really basic, like finding random things to read on Twitter, I just assumed everyone did that. Most people don't do. So there was an activity that I did that other people didn't do. I kind of, in the early days in my head, I called it the Twitter arbitrage. I was just like, didn't you see this? This story went viral on Twitter. And they're like, oh, wait, these are like, 35 year old finance people that think Twitter is weird. Um, so, so there was like a, an arbitrage there, but honestly, and, and to this day, Colin, um, it's the accountability. It's like for, for how I want to live my life, if I'm not right, finding five interesting ideas and not like ideas with a little eye, not a big eye and just like synthesize distilling them in my head, to, to just make something of them, that's not the kind of life that I personally want to live. So it was, it's almost like the people that like, like publish their workouts, right? They're like, if you, if you say you're going to run a, an Ironman and tweet about it all the time, you better fucking run the Ironman. Um, and so there was, a, there was an embedded public accountability in that that worked very well for me. Now, there's two sides of that coin where you can also make up the accountability and be like, oh my God, they're expecting this from me every week and like lose sleep over it and all that. That, and I've tasted that many times in this process. That can lead you very quickly to burnout. Um, in fact, I, in the spirit of like making your journey public, I was hitting that point and I wrote like, guys, I need to take a break. I'm burnt out. And so many people were like, take as long as you need, like, we're there for you, we're here to support you. So it's just like the accountability story that was very helpful to me can quickly turn on a dime and, and become this like made up story uh, that, that is actually very destructive.
any other questions? This might sound basic, but how do you um, keep your content fresh? As in, you talked about generating five ideas, and I understand Twitter might be one big source mm -hmm. of material, but uh, are there any other, um, I don't know, thing sites that you go to regularly, or you know, is there a process to the idea generation? Yeah, that's a great. Uh, that's a great question, um, Radhika. So I'll answer it specifically, but I'll I'll, I'll also um, I'll also uh, answer it theoretically. Um, the theoretical thing, the theoretical answer is, once you engage in a creative activity, you start to see the world through a different lens. So what do I mean by that? Um, when I started, I'm not a web person or a web designer. But when I started a website and WordPress, I quickly learned that like, there's a few different ways in which people set up their websites. There's like a giant like hero banner. They'll put the links on top. Sometimes the links will be centered. Sometimes they'll be to the right. Sometimes there'll be two levels of links. Sometimes there'll be a menu. I never really noticed any of that. The day I had to create a website, I could never look at another website the same way because automatically I was like, oh, that's cool. They put this button on the right side or like they put their social on the bottom. And so as soon as you commit to a creative practice, you will see the world around you differently. And so again, to use another example, um, I have stumbled. I love design now just because from the newsletter, I had to build a website, I had to build a logo, uh, I had to pick colors, I had to pick fonts. Like, I don't have any help in doing all this stuff. And so I personally found it fascinating to think about like, what colors, like green is a soothing color, red triggers anxiety, yellow is for, I don't know. Like, there's all these like rules, you know? And so, uh, and so again, like I derive so much joy in walking through airports because they have the giant advertisements. Like they're so big and they're like, you could just tell how much effort went into every word. It's like phenomenal copywriting. It's great design. It's great photography. It's good typography. And so, so again, once you start, you will, you will start to see the world around you differently. So that was a very theoretical answer. But in terms of um, pragmatic answers, I would say it's really gonna depend on, um, on what your topics are. But I would really like introspect is like, where, do you, where is that, that pull coming from? Like, and, and someone might view it as destructive, like, I, I spend so much time on Reddit. Like people tell me that all the time. It's like, well, there's something there that's, that's, that's bringing you there. Instead of viewing it as a negative, what is the thing that's so compelling? And, and they're like, oh, well, no one cares about, you know, this type of video games or, you know, paper. Or like, you're like, no, so, some people do. So, so I would say like, really like, because I think if you're, if you're forcing something, if you're like every day I'm gonna sit in front of Twitter for an hour and like get this, it's just, it's not going to uh, fan out. And so it doesn't even have to be digital, right? Like it could be the conversations that you find yourself having with people. I don't know, like you could have a newsletter where, uh, you know, I probably have 15 friends that live in 15 different countries. Um, I could, every week I could call up one friend and be like, what's the weirdest non-15, like what's the weirdest thing in, that people do in your country that they don't do in other countries? And then you just, that's your newsletter. Um, so I would, I would say like, find out where you're pulled, you know, like uh, some questions that, that could be helpful is like, what's the activity that makes time disappear when you kind of like, you're doing something and you look up and like five hours went by, like, is it baking? Then like, that's a clue. Um, 
or are you, con you know, are you constantly with your kids? Or are you constantly on a, on a plane? Like, you know, if you're constantly flying, like if you're a McKinsey consultant, you could probably write a great letter about like a newsletter about like the quirks of business travel. I, th I think lots of people would read that um, because it is this kind of quirky thing that lots of people have to do that like is not fun, but it, it could be fun. Um, so, um, so that, that's, that's how I'd answer that. And, uh, Colin, I just, uh, erased your message, but, um, he sent, he, he sent a message about, uh, Kevin Kelly's thousand true fans and his message. And, and, and I believe, and Colin, feel free to jump in that Kevin Kelly said, like, if you have a thousand people who will pay you a uh, hundred dollars, uh, a year, that's a hundred thousand, that's a hundred thousand dollars of revenue and finding a thousand people in the days of the internet is, it's not easy, but it's definitely, definitely possible. There's a newsletter creator that uh, his name is Craig Maud. And he, he is this thing where he like, it's like a paid newsletter about him doing walking tours of Japan. Um, like I didn't click through it, but, uh, but it's like, there really is no limit to, uh, to, um, to that. And then Rod, uh, Radhika, what I would say is, it then becomes a question of habit, right? Like if the thing is calling one friend every week, then, then that you, have to, you have to flip that thing into, into becoming a habit, right? So it becomes less about like what the thing is and more about the commitment to the thing itself. And so then you get into like a much broader conversation about uh, habit formation. But like any habit, right? Uh, if you don't like exercising, but you like surfing, well, good thing you could just make it a habit to go surfing because it's great exercise, right? Like if you could find those like, you know, um, my friend, uh, what's his name? Um, Carl Richards from Big Behavior Gap. He calls them yes, yeses, where it's like it's a win-win on, on both sides. And I would add one last thing. I mean, this is where things like uh, Notion or Evernote or Omni, whatever your digital system comes in, like having like a tiny, tiny workflow. Like for me, every time I see an interesting article, I just clip it in. I used to clip it into Instapaper for many, many years. Just have like this giant trove of stories I found interesting, 80% of which I've never read. Um, now I just moved it to Notion. I have like a few little extra fields where I can put check boxes if they look like more interesting, things like that. I think the challenge comes in for me. I'm not a web person either. And the more I try to engage, uh, rabbit hole is a good word. Uh, it just takes you on so many tangents and everything is interesting. And I would have started on some other path. And then at the end of the day, you're like, I don't believe where do they went. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and especially with the way the algorithms are working these days, you know, Google gives me this whole feed of stuff, which I'll click on one item. And sometimes I think, my gosh, either the algorithm is really working very well or they're snooping into my conversations because I can probably, you know, I'm being paranoid, but it literally is like I'll be talking to my girls about something and up will pop a suggestion about something like is is there a recording thing that is happening here? I don't know. This is very mm -hmm. creepy. Yeah. Well, um, I, I would say, you know, maybe think about those rabbit holes. Like um, you could maybe like journal to yourself, you know, like I went down this rabbit hole today and I landed on these three themes. These three themes grabbed my attention. And then tomorrow, these four themes grabbed my attention. And tomorrow, these five, you know, this one theme grabbed my attention. And maybe after two weeks, you look back and you're like, oh, there's, a, there's actually a thread here. You know, the thread might be, uh, you know, sustainability, travel, and motherhood, you know. Um, and maybe those threads form the basis of your newsletter collectively um, in the kind of generalist approach. Or you think one of them is compelling enough and rich enough with ideas. Uh, and also keep in mind in the early days, right, it's, it is a creative project, right? Like you could... You just you're not beholden to any format right I, I think if anything that's why i really push the generalist view for as lo like as long as possible because there's a good chance that the whole process becomes more cumbersome than the process of like doing it than 
than like the finding the idea, like than, than the interest in the ideas themselves. Thanks. Can I just add a teeny tiny riff on that? Yeah, please. I, I think there's a really important distinction um, and I'll, I'll throw the original link in chat to um, one of Seth Godin's blog posts called Yak Shaving. Okay. Between Yak Shaving, which is going to the ends of the internet, reading every review you can find on say Substack or any other software platform versus what Kay just said a moment ago about finding the thing that you're nerdy about. Because the going down the nerdy rabbit hole that other people want to go down is where the thousand true fans are writing a newsletter about newsletters if that's not in fact the thing that you're if that's not the tribe you're trying to connect mm -hmm. but it's just the way that you waste a tuesday rather than shipping the newsletter um i think that's how we get stuck and i've done that over and over and over again i'll, I'll go into wikipedia looking for one thing and then mm -hmm. 20 hours and forty thousand links later <laughs> i didn't do what i was supposed to do today and that's, uh, Colin, that's the great thing about the newsletter is that there's this implicit accountability, right? Like if I don't, if I don't show up, like I get a lot of emails saying like, and I, and I don't explain my absence. I get a lot, and I get a lot of emails saying, hey, what happened? Um, and that's good, like 80 to 90% of the time, 10% of the time, it's terrifying. Um, so, uh, but, but I do, that, that, that is kind of what got me from week one to week two, uh, to your earlier question. And I, I mean, here we're on a very philosophical uh, question again, but I think that like, I, I think there's two things that, that come out from what you just said. One is that messy is okay. Like the, the internet, like my mom still corrects, like she, she sends me typos in my blog posts. And I'm, I'm just like, I love you, mom. I, I, I know why you're doing this. It doesn't matter. Like, it can't be laden with typos. But if there's an occasional typo, like, no one gives a fuck. Um, and so, so messy is okay. Again, once you clear a certain threshold. Um, the second thing, and this is probably a, a bigger thing, is that the internet is like, it's like, um, pornography for creativity where you can just read about being creative forever um and you could read about online courses you could read about newsletters and and there's a lot of good stuff on all of these topics but i'll tell you i didn't read and i read very little about online courses i had a few conversations mostly with my friend tiago um, but I didn't really read because something like online course, you can't even tell what's content marketing and like real, like, like good quality content. It's just hard to tell because they're so good at gaming the algorithms that I just was like, you know what, I'm just going to start it. And the, the learning that you get by doing something uh, is you can't, it, there's no comparison. And that's why, I mean, that's why I think I'll be an internet creator for the rest of my life because the tools are so cheap. Substack, they're so powerful. I'm Zoom, I mean, look at this. We're like talking a around the world, uh, and I'm in I'm in my my bedroom, and like you can even see like like a makeshift studio lighting and like uh, you know an open bathroom door behind me. Um, so like the tools for creation are basically free or close to free, so you have no excuse, right? And then on top of that, the feedback loops are so quick. Like the reason that the Notion course happened so quickly. It's because that's what everyone was clicking on. Like I saw the demand as I was writing the newsletter. And so the feedback loops are so quick that you can quickly kind of like, uh, like adjust and adapt and iterate and test. The, the, the only cost is, I mean, and it's a big one, is the opportunity cost of your time. I think the biggest one is like the wasted rabbit holes. But I think those wasted rabbit holes of doing are much more precious than the wasted rabbit holes about reading about doing. Hey Kay, I have a question about the consistency of the newsletter. Yes. So it seems like that's kind of, I mean, like the most important barrier or the biggest barrier, right? Because that's what's going to make the difference between, you know, people are interested and kind of dabble a little bit like I have done and, you know, send a few to a few friends and then you know, lose interest for a week or forget about it for a couple of weeks, you know, what do you have to suggest on 
helping people establish that consistency because that that yeah. seems like like the most important thing for, for yeah I know I, it's a it's a great question um, I would say that I would say there's a there's an advantage of the consistency is like if it's really hard it might not be the right thing for you I mean you talk to any of these these longtime newsletter creators, I, like my guess is Tim Ferriss doesn't even write his own newsletter anymore. But like you talk to people that are in the like four or five year range, they fucking love it. Like it's just fun for them. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't mean it's hard. It's not hard. But, but I think that like if it's so mind numbingly painful, like maybe you just not cut out for it. Um, that being said, you know, it's like, uh, you know, what, who calls Steven Pressfield calls it the resistance, right? Any creative process will have some element of resistance. And so that's where the self-awareness comes in is the resistance. Like, you know, you can get it very existential here. It's like fear of failure. I think for me, a big one is like, I'm a people pleaser. And so like when, once people unsubscribe, like I take it really personally, especially if I know them when like I unsubscribe to newsletters all the time. Like, uh, so, so there's this, so so I would say that introspect into what that res resistance is. Uh, the second thing I would say is to, I would, I would say like cheat a little. And what I mean by that is like do a sprint, like pre-write five weeks of your newsletter or three weeks, because you're going to hit a time where like your kid got sick or you just don't feel like doing it. And it's just nice to have in, in the back pocket where you can just go in and plug in. And by the way, I, this is just a workflow technique. Like I love sprints. I think just like sitting down and working on one thing for like six straight hours versus constant context switching is like a much more, it works much better for me than like work, uh, work grazing. Um, and I can do that because I control my own schedule mostly. Um, so I would say, I would say pre-write it um, a few issues. Uh, and then, uh, I would say have like, have like a good, have like a decent system that, that at least like, like a, have like a, uh, be a magpie, right? Have a way to start to, to collect things, to at least take the friction out of collection, an Evernote clipper, a notebook clipper, to-do list list, your Insta paper, a watch later list on YouTube, um, like whatever, uh, just so you know, like if I'm ever in the dumps or stuck, like I could just go to this place, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and access it. And then the other thing, I mean, I would also really introspect into like, like, why, like, why do I want to do this? Right. And, and I, I will say like, even at this point for me, like, yes, it is a big part of my financial livelihood, but it is, it's just like a, it's like a creative project that, that is just deeply intrinsically rewarding in, its, in and of itself. Um, and I always say like, if I, if I won the lottery tomorrow, like I'd still write Raterades because like, I get, I mean, you know, that that's a lot of the message is like, like human connection, creative expression. Like those are, those are things in life that we seek independent of money. Uh, and, and it's just, a richness of my life. And so I would, the closer you can align that richness to what you care about, what you read about, or even a skill that you're trying to learn, then at least like you have the wind um, uh, blowing in your sails. I guess I would say is like, try to do everything you can to have the wind blowing in your, uh, in your sails, especially at the beginning. Yeah. So keep your, your interests and, and the things that you desire kind of try and have those, uh, play into it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And like, don't, and that's why, and people debate me on this. Like, uh, that's why I think like the general newsletter at the beginning is just better because it, it can, it can kind of go where it can go where you go. Uh, whereas if you did one, like just on, you know, jujitsu for kids, like you could, you know, even for me, like I've started a Notion newsletter, like I do not have the same passion for a Notion newsletter that I do for Rad Rates. Like I, I could, I feel it in my, in my bones. One feels much more like work. Does the frequency of the newsletter make 
a lot of difference. I know you mentioned in one of your slides frequency and consistency kind of go hand in hand, but could I be consistent and less frequent? Could it be a monthly newsletter versus a weekly one? And would it make a difference? I, I, that's a great question. Um, I think that, um, I think that no, uh, I, I think that weekly, the weekly recommendation is very much a, a, a manifestation of my own kind of like uh, gluttony for, for, for pain, um, where I, I, I think that there, there's a trade-off, right? There's a lot less pressure in monthly. It, it, personally, it feels like monthly, it's just like a little bit too much time that like you like you lose a bit of the fire right like it, it kind of like like you you want to be like just a tiny you want a tiny bit of pressure each week or else it just it can just peter away again i, I kid of immigrants i get motivated very much by fear and by like anxiety so like not everyone thinks this way so please take that with a grain of salt but but again, I say it's much easier to move from a month to a week than a week to a month. Um, so I would definitely say it's totally okay to start much wider, much much uh, longer longer gaps, and ratchet in if that's what's going to make uh, make you comfortable with this, like with the preservance of just like a little bit of urgency that, that you want to like maintain the other thing too and this goes to evan's question like you're just going to get better at it so if you do it 25 weekly or 25 monthly like you'll be if you just think about news newsletter skill you'll be uh at the same point it will take you two years to get to that point of skill versus half a year and that that becomes like a personal preference it's a, it totally is a skill by the way like you become more skilled at it the longer you stay in the game And it seems like the consistency and then keeping it as small and simple as possible in the beginning and building yep. that, that muscle and that habit of the consistency instead Absolutely. of like something big and fancy once a month to me. A anyway. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up. Just like it's much easier to go from eight, you know, from a monthly to a weekly, it's much easier to go from a one paragraph newsletter to a four paragraph newsletter than the other way around. So absolutely, start small, and maybe like start small every two weeks, and then pull it in a week after you've hit, you know, you feel good about it, right? To uh, test your systems, um, but but absolutely, and don't. And this is why I really think Substack is such a great option. Like you don't have to worry about anything, and it looks really, really good. All the other solutions where you have to stitch things together something's going to look off and you're going to go down a rabbit hole with tech support or Reddit trying to fix it. And you're going to get pissed off and you were on, right. You used all your willpower for the week and it's just going to dip. And then you're going to skip that week. And then the next week will come and you'll be feeling shitty about yourself or skipping the prior week. And then it will end. So like, I really do think Substack is a, is quite magical in that, that it really like, to me, it's all about removing excuses. Um, and, and that's like the cleanest way to, to, to re remove the excuse. Awesome. Anyone else? I know we're over, but I love this topic. So I can stay as long as you guys want to ask questions. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. So how do you think about combining uh, like your, your personal life and things you find interesting on online? Like I'm, I'm a senior in college and I'm thinking it might be fun to start a newsletter after I graduate to kind of stay in touch with people but I also have lots of topics and things I find online that it would be interesting to share stuff about so yeah how, how do you think about combining the, the personal yeah. and professional aspects it's a it's a good it's a good question so I would say the, the news like a newsletter to stay in touch with people at some point would would flatline in the sense that like you've heard of Dunbar's number where it's like the most relationships we could have is 150. So at some point you like, you're just not going to, 
be wanting to keep in touch with 18,000 people. Um, and so by definition, you would have capped your, um, you would have capped, you know, the size of that kind of like keep in touch newsletter. But here's the, the flip side of it is that chances are all the people you want to keep in touch with would want to sign up to your topical based newsletter anyway, because they're your friend or they're in, they find you interesting. And so the cool thing about the, what I've found with my newsletter is a lot of my friends there is just like, dude, you send way too much stuff. I can't keep up. I don't know why, how you do it, why you do it. But I just love seeing your name in my inbox because each week it just reminds me of you. And, and so you could absolutely build that rapport and they might click in like once every 10 and be like, hey, I wonder what Gavin's up to today, you know, this week. Um, and there's like, or they might be like, oh, there goes Gavin, like writing about esports again, you know? Uh, he's like, doesn't he know that I don't give a shit about that? Um, so, but you have that, like, cause so much about staying in touch with people is just having that, that common thing to talk about. And the common thing to talk about can sometimes even be like, like, oh, you talked about that thing that I'm not interested in. Hey, how's it going? You know? So. Um, I, I get so many, um, and, and I might give you like a little bit of example, examples. Like when I left, when I started my newsletter, most of the initial, probably like 500 people that joined were people, they were kind of like professional acquaintances and I was quitting Wall Street. And so they had like this kind of voyeuristic angle. I mean, I think they, I was a likable person. So they were like, oh yeah, nice guy. He's got a newsletter. I would always promote it. I'm like, oh, I'm leaving. Like, by the way, like I have this newsletter if you want to keep in touch. Um, but so that was the original audience. Um, and so it was like a very heavy finance audience. And I'm removed from the industry five years now. There are so many of them are still, my audience, I haven't run that numbers on it. I would guess like a third of it is, is Wall Street people because they just stuck around because, you know, I don't, a mix of like following my journey, following the like the random things that I could occasionally deliver to being like a super fan. Like there, there's the mix of, of all of them. Yeah, awesome, thanks. Yeah, good luck, man. Anybody else? I gotta run, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, thank you, Colin. Um, so I would just, I would ask uh, if, is anyone, uh, I guess, like, just raise your hand. Do you have a newsletter currently? So Colin has one and Evan has one. And is, uh, do you plan on starting one? And Rob, uh, Robin has one. Uh, do you, for those who didn't answer, do you plan on starting one in the next couple months? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, I also, so thank you guys. Thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting Rad Reads. Um, I love this topic. Um, I'll put in the follow-up uh, our Slack group, but we have an entire channel dedicated to newsletters. Um, so we talk about all these things, the minutia, the tech stack. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, I, I thank you all for your support and I will see you guys. Uh, I will see you guys on the interwebs. Thank you. Thank you.